Hey, everybody, and welcome back to another episode. I'm your host, Brandon Cobb, co-founder of HBG Capital. And today I've got Dr. Robert Scranton. He is a former financial executive who teaches people how to use their current debts and expenses. That's right. To grow their wealth outside of the traditional approaches. So with his experience in accounting and finance, as well as his experience as a formal chief financial architect of a cutting edge financial firm, Dr. Robert has been able to help people all over the United States take advantage of this infinite banking concept, something we're going to talk about more today. He hopes to teach people how to recapture, reuse, and recycle their own money over and over again so it stays inside of their family instead of making other people rich. Dr. Robert, it is great to have you on the show. Thank you so much, Brandon. Uh, look, looking forward to it. Yeah, this is going to be a lot of fun. So we've definitely discussed this infinite banking concept before. You and I are having a conversation before this show. I'm excited to get into some real world examples because I think that's what's been missing on some of the past. So we're going to get into that. Before we do, give the audience some context on your background. What's your story? Yeah, so I well, I first got my original degree in accounting and finance, and so I was telling you I was working in Chicago for a, you know public accounting firm doing tax returns for uh, large corporations and some pretty rich individuals and doing audits of companies, and I had an accident, a car accident, and had an injury nobody could help me with, uh, and so I, I after two and a half years somebody suggests I go see this chiropractor and about three months I was fixed and had no more problem and couldn't believe it. And I thought, gee, I think I'd like to help people the way that guy helped me. And, uh, you know, went into practice and enjoyed that quite a bit, but I found I was always helping my fellow chiropractors with their finances. Uh, something <laughs> I just took for granted. I thought everybody knew how to do that. Uh, you know, if they were in business, but realized, no, most chiropractors went to school to be healers and help people and all of a sudden found themselves as entrepreneurs sort of unexpectedly and uh, just didn't know anything about uh, even you know balance sheets or what an income statement was and so forth. So I always enjoyed doing that. And I had a chance to uh, sell my practice here in Illinois and move out here to Utah and work for a company that specialized in helping entrepreneurs and, uh, you know, helping doctors and, and chiropractors. And, and this was my favorite part of what we did was uh, teaching people about that infinite banking system. And I, I kind of, I switched my whole financial world to that in 2009. I'd been doing what everybody else has probably been doing and, you know, traditional finance, give my money to my financial advisor and putting it in my 401k and probably like everybody else. I did. I didn't know much about it. I just knew what a quarterly statement went up or down and that was about yeah. it. And one quarter, it went down by about 45% in 2009. And I said, you know, this isn't for me. I need to look into something or figure something else out. Cause what if this had been the year that I retired um, oh, God. And I wasn't working or didn't have an income or ability to recover from that. It was just a good, uh, inexpensive lesson to learn at that point. And that's when I really uh, started focusing on this uh, infinite banking uh, concept. And I've been teaching people about it uh, ever since the last 15 years. I started my own uh, infinite banking uh, uh, policy, uh, if you will, and and started growing my banking system and and teaching other people about it. I want to get into more about that transition from the realization, oh my gosh, 45% loss in my portfolio, at least on paper, hopefully he didn't sell in 2009, and what you did to not only recover from that, but the game plan to say, hey, look, I need to do something different so I don't end up with this 49% loss in the future when I am actually retiring. So thank God you weren't at that stage. But I'm curious, right. when, you, when you were working with these other chiropractors, what was it about the profit and loss and balance sheet that you were utilizing to successfully manage your finances that these other business owners in the same industry were not? Well, yeah, I think I found that uh, I just would shake my head because almost all in all, their discussion and talk was about chasing that top line number. And the bragging rights of the chiropractic association and conventions and how many people they saw in their office and all this kind of stuff. And I'm always like, mm -hmm. you know, because I really realized when I was working for that firm that, uh, you know, a lot of these doctors did have some pretty phenomenal numbers. But I realized like, oh, in my practice, I was maybe half the revenue or a third of the revenue and twice as profitable. 
Um, and I'm just like, well, that's crazy because I was always looking at that sense. I just realized that it was the spread between your income and expenses that was really, you know, the the important thing, not the top number. And just chasing that at, you know, the, um, uh, you know, disregarding everything else mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you know, what you're spending to get there and, and, and all that sort of stuff. It's the profitability that was really what was uh what was missing for both of these doctors and just no understanding of basic financial uh principles you know i use uh, an example and when i teach about how you know we sh we show people how they can you know spend at 6% and earn at 4% and actually make money and come out ahead and most chiropractors look at they'll just argue with me all day long and they're like no doctor rob you're losing 2% that can't be that can't be true and i'll show them with math that it's absolutely 100% true. Um, I, I have a, a training on our website. I go through that. It's just math, but because uh, they, they, they just don't have uh, uh, understand of basic financial principles and and uh, knowledge, unfortunately. They don't, we just don't really get that in, you know, schools, doctors. Yeah, no, you don't. They teach the medical profession, not the how to run a business side of things. So they're focused on that very top number, revenues, which there's a famous line from, a book that's businesses don't die from starvation. They die from indigestion or bloatation. And I mean, I don't think that that could be further from the truth because they're chasing, oh my gosh, I'm hungry. I need more sales, more sales, more sales. When they're not looking at their overhead, they're not seeing how bloated they are. They're not looking at the employees that they probably have kept on that they should have let go or those software programs that they bought last year and are like on an annual renewal and they don't need any more. They're not paying attention. And so they're bleeding and they don't even know it. Is that an accurate description? That's absolutely accurate. And even when they get their first business loan, you know, they don't even think about the idea of having a cash reserve or a buffer or the you know mindset that a hiccup could happen or something could go wrong that's unanticipated, which is really actually like the norm in business. Yeah. <laughs> and so they'll take their business loan and they'll spend it all down, you know, instead of leaving some, you know, back in that first month or two or six months when they might have a dip or a uh, a downturn and boom, it just overnight they're out of business because there's no no money to keep the lights on, you know, even. It's yeah, mind yeah, you're, but, you're, it's, it's okay. all about managing cash flow. I, I made a post, social media post here recently. I posted like our cash flow sheets. We've got cash flow sheet for the business and a cash flow sheet for each individual real estate project we do to show money coming in and as money coming out and the ongoing net cash basis at the bottom. And obviously the goal is, to project all your expenses out and all of your future income and make sure that that bottom number, your cash on hand is always positive because if it's going to go negative, well, you're going to have a problem. And at least that cash flow sheet allows you to get there. And I'm sure this is an invaluable tool for your, your chiropractors that you were, you were working with as well. On the story moving to the infinite banking concept, um, give the audience a little bit of context what this is if they're Unfam unfamiliar with it. Yeah. So, you know, I realized as a doctor, even myself that, you know, I tried, you know, various you know, types of investing and actually since I, the investing that I'd done in the past always ended up in disaster catastrophe as a busy doctor will tell you, whether it's a stock trading system or even, you know, trying to do some sort of real estate avenue um, until they get, you know, enough experience or, uh, you know, enough cash reserves, as we said, under their belt. Uh, most things are a distraction. And, you know, if they even if they start doing well with it, something will happen, you know, two staff members will quit the same day. And now they're in a flurry trying to hire new people and write the ship and, you know, cover all their bases. And, you know, that investment they had, they didn't pay attention to it. Some trigger that they were told them they were supposed to buy or sell and they didn't because they were distracted with other stuff. And it usually ends up turning out in a disaster. So I realized for doctors, they really need something that's really a true set it and forget it. Something that's been around for 200 years, something that will never go down, something mm -hmm. that will only grow and grow more substantially every single year that they have it, and that will be a system that they'll have and utilize for their uh, entire lifetime. And as I looked at things and assess things, uh, you know, this uh, infinite banking system has some features and benefits uh, that, that, that frank, frankly, there's no other financial tool or instrument or product on, on the planet that has these same uh, features and benefits 
Uh, one of the the biggest ones you and I talked about before we got on the uh, the, the recording here, Brandon, was the ability to earn uh, you know a rate of interest on the same dollar in two different places at the same time. Uh, usually, you can only do that once. And so you mentioned earlier a lot of our uh, what I, what I do I've, I've been able to acquire three properties that I own: my house, uh, commercial property, and a cabin that we own. I was able to acquire all those because I had large reserves in my own bank uh, that I was able to move in quickly, make an all cash offer. And uh, the and the seller, quite frankly, just felt more comfortable with me than waiting on all these people going and begging and pleading at a bank that they may never get approved. And, and they may pass up other opportunities to sell it in the meantime, even if it meant selling it for a slightly less amount, they loved the large down payment and the fact that I was able to come to the table with it so quickly because I didn't have to go ask or beg permission from anybody. I just asked me, the banker, the bank of Rob, and I said, yes, uh, uh, of course. And <clears throat> so I was able to acquire those properties that were amazing properties that I probably would have got bought out from underneath me had I not been able to do that. And I was actually because I came with sub a substantial amount up front, able, actually able to work, uh, acquire them all for less than asking price. That's an interesting um, mindset around sellers that I don't think we take into consideration a lot of times that sometimes when they decide to sell, they they want to sell and they want a guaranteed sale that they know is going to happen once they made up that mind. It's, it's like you and me, once we decide, I don't, you know, uh, I, I don't want this car anymore. You know, we're the decisions already been made. It's just the faster we can make it happen. Uh, yeah. the faster we can make it happen, the better. And that my other favorite thing to do, you'd ask about earlier, as far as how I use my banking system is uh, we have a, a good network of people that are, 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 you know, have these large cash reserves in their own banks and they're looking to put that money to work and send those little green men out and make sure they come back and bring their friends with them. And we have a large group of people that are also, this is their main profession. Like you said, they're, they're flippers, real estate investors, and they're always looking for capital to access for projects that they need, you know, cash quickly. And so we've got this network of people where, you know, people will, you know, take a hundred or $200,000 in cash value and loan it out to a flipper, get first lien on a, a piece of property that he's flipping. And he just needs to, that capital to utilize. And he may pay him 6% to have it for a month or two months. And meanwhile, our client never uh, stops earning on those dollars, even while he has them loaned out. So he continues earning and growing and compounding that cash inside his policy. At the same time, he's got it lent, you know, lent out to somebody else, and all the money that's growing and accumulating inside the policy, uh, you know, grows tax free. So they could use it now or later, or you know, even in retirement or any time they want, uh, completely tax free because they're using the form of loans. And as you know, you've never paid uh, taxes on any loan that you've ever taken out for anything your entire life. So let's just break this down because this is where a lot of people get confused on this infinite banking concept. They go, okay, infinite banking, I am my own bank. Rob, what's the difference between having my cash sitting in a bank account and then converting that cash over into a whole term life insurance policy, which is what this is. You're taking your cash and putting it in a whole term life insurance policy, something that you're able to borrow against, you're essentially getting a, a loan from that whole term life insurance policy. And the main difference is there's not many assets out there that you can borrow up to like 100% of the value of, right? You know, you can borrow against your house and go get a HELOC. You can go borrow against, you know, your car sometimes and, and get a loan on like the, the title, but it's only a percentage, right? Whereas this, this whole term life insurance policy, you can borrow up to almost the full amount that's in that policy and use it for investments. And, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, when it's in that whole term life insurance policy, acts as an investment. It is invested and it's actually growing just like a stock would or an index fund or a piece of real estate. So you're borrowing against it. It continues to appreciate and you can then utilize that money in other investments like real estate and have it appreciate. So you're you're getting appreciation and like from the same investment in two different areas. Am I on the ball here? Fill in the gaps. Pretty close. Uh, so I address a couple of issues with that. So yeah, just imagine the the power 
of the ability to, in, in a perfect scenario, if every dollar you earn the rest of your life, you would continue to earn interest on for the rest of your life. With this system, that's actually possible. And we can get into a lot more details as well or tell people about some resources later on down the road. The other thing that I would I would mention uh, and, and address uh, just because I think it's pertinent is you mentioned this being an, an investment or like an investment. I would say no, uh, it's not an investment from the standpoint that an investment to my to you know my understanding and my definition, an investment is something that could go up, but it could go down. Uh, this is not that because it can only go up. Um, it's guaranteed to go up because it's in a contract with the life insurance company. So it will never go down. So there is no risk. So from that standpoint, it's not an investment or think of it as a much better investment than investment. And the other thing I would talk about, what's the difference between you know, having your money and custodying it in your own banking system. And that's really most of what we're talking about is really taking back the banking function of your in your life for the rest of your life. So one thing I would talk about, and I hope this will be of interest uh, in today's world and environment, is just talk about the from the aspect of risk, you know, keeping your money. If you had $500,000 in Wells Fargo, um, a lot of risk. Uh, you know, most people don't realize in the Great Depression, over 3,000 banks went out of business, went bankrupt. Um, zero mutual insurance companies went bankrupt during the Great Depression. And that's all that we use for this infinite banking concept is mutualized uh, you know, whole life insurance companies because they're designed for the benefit of the policy holders. They're not you know, traded on, the, uh, uh, on the, the, the stock market and so forth. And so when we talk about risk, um, you, you know, when you, you put money into your own banking system, all that money inside there, that cash value is considered part of the death benefit of the life insurance policy. And as such, it is not subject to uh, liens, judgments, IRS decisions, lawsuits like it is. If it's sitting in Wells Fargo, it's exposed to all those things. And the more money you make, the bigger a target you are, because a lot of people, you know, in today's world, get the idea that they should have access to your money. They probably deserve it more than you did anyways, because if you have more than they think you should, you probably did something wrong or dishonest or legal to acquire it in the first place. And they ought to be entitled to some of it after all. Uh, anyhow, once you shift that and move it from, you know, Wells Fargo or Bank America into Brandon's banking system, that takes that, you know, completely off the table, takes it off the, the radar entirely. And, you know, when we have things going on like Gavin Newsom in California, looks like he's likely to eventually get his wish in passing, passing his wealth tax because, you know, they have a $6.8 billion budget deficit in California because all the people flee in that state. So they're going to have to make it up some way. So they're going to institute this wealth tax. And unfortunately, a lot of times what happens in California eventually spreads, uh, you know, across the rest of the company. So that country, so that means that they're going to tax you on your, your house, your 401k, your retirement accounts, everything in your bank, your, your cars, your, 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 uh, your uh, your boat, uh, you know, anything that you own, there'll be a tax on that. Well, if you just move some of your assets and you know put it into cash value in this whole life insurance policy, that's legally considered part of the death benefit of your life insurance policy, legally not considered part of your death benefit, it wouldn't be taxed under that scenario. Also, as we talk about risk in a traditional bank, you know, over the last you know, few years since the pandemic, and even in back in 2008, 2009, we've seen a lot of the media about uh, bank bailouts and how much money the government spent on bailing this out and bailing that out and why we've got such inflation like we have right now and so forth. What most people don't realize is that uh, there is something, have you ever heard of something called a bank bail-in, Brandon? Bank bail-in, I have heard of this, explain it. So uh, back in 2012, during the Obama administration, as a, uh, you, you know, kind of a as they were trying to sift uh, through the rubble and dust and debris of 2008, 2009, and the you know financial uh, crisis and the the housing industry that kind of triggered a lot of that, uh, they passed this law called the Dodd Frank out, the Dodd Frank law, and it allows for something called a bail-in. So what that means basically is that if any money that you have on deposit at a bank, if the bank gets so in trouble or a government gets to the point where it either won't bail out the banks or it can no longer bail out the banks, um, it allows the banks to bail themselves out essentially, a bail in by taking your money in your account, using it 
and, and the bank could legally, because of that law, use that money that's your money to bail themselves out. And you no longer have that money anymore. And that's, uh, you know, that's pretty frightening, you know, to me that that's even a law that's possible, uh, you know, similar to the way most people have no idea that 401ks and IRAs and a lot of the things people traditionally invest in, um, that that money is not even actually their money. Uh, you, you know, people think that that's their money, but when they fill that out at their company meeting about their, you know, qualified retirement accounts, uh, all that fine print, almost nobody ever reads that. Any of your listeners ask themselves, did you read all that? And I'm sure their answer will be no. And those contracts are all FBO contracts. And what that means is that that money is being held for benefit of Brandon, being held for benefit of Rob. And that also means that, therefore, it's not our money. And so at any time the government wanted, with a simple piece of legislation, they could confiscate all the money in the 401ks and IRAs across the entire country at any time that they wanted. In fact, during the Obama administration, I forget his name now, but there was a congressman that went on the floor of Congress and actually proposed that and said, you know, we have about this amount of you know national debt and about this same exact amount in all these 401ks and IRAs. Why don't we just, for the greater good and the, for the benefit of us all, just you know start you know have a, a a big reset and just take all that money and pay out the national debt and kind of reset and start over from scratch. Thankfully, he got laughed off the house, the floor of Congress. But the fact that that's even possible, uh, I, I think, is is pretty frightening because if the ever government ever got in a bad enough situation, um, they they have every legal right to do that, and most people just have absolutely no idea. They're compl completely content and comfortable in doing that uh, because everybody else is doing it, just like putting their money in a bank, even though four of the top 10 largest banks in the United States just a year ago uh, went completely out of, you know, went completely out of business, went completely uh, bust. So that would be the two things that I would address is, you know, the, the, the risk and is that an investment from your question? <laughs> yeah, no, 100%. This is interesting. So you said that it's, it's not an investment in the sense that it can't go down which investments right. can all go down, right? There's always risk. This is pretty much guaranteed to go up. How is that possible? You mentioned contracts with the insurance company. Yeah, so, well, the insurance company is invested in very stable things, mostly long-term bonds, and they're they're constantly buying. So over time, they're buying bonds at higher rates and lower rates. And so they have a pretty consistent, you know, because they've been around for 100, 120 years. And so they've been buying these, you know, long-term bonds, and they buy more, sure, when the interest rates are more favorable and so forth. And so they can pay out a pretty uh, consistent uh, rate return, um, uh, you know, to... Uh, to grow those cash values. And the other thing about, and the reason we only can do this infinite banking system with mutualized insurance companies is because with a mutual insurance company, again, it was created kind of like a, a savings and loan or a credit union. It was created in the beginning for the benefit of the members. And so mm -hmm. they're not necessarily looking to make a, a profit or that's not the main motivation. It's for the benefit of the members. So as a policy holder with a whole life insurance company, uh, you're actually one of the only you're actually one of the owners of the company and as such when the company profits we participate in the form of dividends so they pay us dividends as well and we just reinvest those into buying more paid up additions and you know growing the cash value and more death benefit uh over over time so the death benefit grows uh, the cash value grows even though the premiums stay the same from now until however many years later you know, whether that's 10 15 50 or 70 years um, you know, from now, my dad has a policy that's still in force that his father bought on him in 1951. And it's pretty, I mean, it's interesting from the standpoint that it's not a lot of money, but it teaches the, the principal and what's going on. That $48 a year uh, premium, $48 a year premium from 1951, yeah. uh, that purchases an additional uh, amount of cash value. The cash value of that $48 deposit grows by $684 a year. That's a 1,300% return cash on cash on the dollars that he's putting into that policy uh, year after year. It's all growing tax-free. He won't have to pay tax on it if he uses that money now. And when he dies, it'll pass tax-free uh, to probably my brother. I think he likes him better than, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, whoever it goes <laughs> to will receive all that money uh, tax-free as well in the future. But pretty Lots amazing. Of great benefits here. 
and grow it, your, your cash on cash 1300% in a guaranteed manner. And it will only just keep getting better every single year. Oh, that was my next question. So like what kind of average returns are you seeing across the industry? So you invest your, your cash in this whole term life insurance policy. It's with an insurance company, essentially. So it's like a life insurance policy. You die, you get this money and it's going to appreciate. It's appreciating because it's being invested by the insurance company into long-term bonds, which have never defaulted. And as an owner of that company that owns the bonds, because you're you're buying into it, you get a share of the profits. And so it's it's going up essentially by, by way of bonds, right? They're never selling off these bonds uh, for a loss. They're always just waiting for it to appreciate, which means you're you know almost guaranteed to get your money back because the government can always print more money. And then it also grows tax-free. So that's another huge benefit. And then you're able to borrow against this policy and also invest it. So let's start there. How are you using this vehicle to invest in some alternative asset classes other than you mentioned a big, big reason you started doing this was to get away from that 49% hit you took in 2008 and 2009. What adjustments have you made since then? And what are you investing in? Well, yeah, I mean, you you make a good point. To me, there's, uh, there's so much economic value, and you know the economic value of certainty and knowing exactly how something's going to play out. I mean, I can predict in the future, know exactly how much money is going to to be in there, what the stock market or you know four hundred one k. You really had no idea. I mean, it's uh, you, you know like a Monte Carlo casino game to some degree, as far as how that's going to turn out. But yeah, I, I talked about the three the three properties I currently own, the fact that I was able to acquire them. I mean, sometimes there's a lot of demand for really amazing properties, and there's not that many really amazing properties. Um, you know, when you have a, a Vista or a location or uh, what, what, what have you, and having access to capital quickly, even though I didn't even know that I... I wanted that building until it came, you know, available. But because I had this war chest that I'd been building up for years, this uh, amazing, you know, sort of glorified savings uh, account, it allowed me instead of having the bucket system. You probably heard of that, Brandon, where you put this amount of money in here for your emergency fund, and you put this amount of money in for savings, you put this amount of money in for your retirement, and yeah, I mean, to me, I think of this as the one bucket system. I'm putting it all into this this place that's protected that's growing but i could use it for any of those purposes you know ultimately it's a lot less to keep track of and one of my favorite things to do is uh find uh real estate investors i'm currently invested in a, in a trucking company that's paying you know six percent per month getting people into these trucks uh it, you know it's almost like real estate when you think of a truck and the uh, the fact that every truck out there is a business um, and even, even while I have that money borrowed out, I still continue to earn inside my policy, even while, you know, I'm helping these people buy these trucks, giving them loan short terms, they're, you know, paying us back. And so I'm earning in two places at one time. And my other favorite place is uh, we have a lot of our clients that are real estate, uh, you know, investors. And so we have a large community of people that are looking for access to capital and people that are looking to put capital to work. And so similar thing, you know, flippers, real estate investors, some of them pay 1% a month, some will, you know, for longer term investments and, and some of them will pay, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, you know, 6% uh, to have it for 30 days or 6% for 60 days or, or what have you. So I'm earning that in two different places at one time. Um, and, uh, you know, any other time I'd invested in my life in the past, I had to take money out of Wells Fargo, even though I was only earning, you know, 0.01%. And I was getting taxed on that. And it was all subject to judgments, liens, IRS decisions, and lawsuits like we talked about. But as soon as I took it out of Wall, you know, Wells Fargo, I stopped earning even that 0.01%. Whereas with this system, I never stop uh, the continuous compounding my entire life. I will continue to reap that benefit uh, from that, no matter what I do with those. Even if I decide that I didn't want to pay the loan back, uh, you know, at some point, um, I would still keep earning on that inside the policy. That was my next question was, is there a time limit when you, you take a loan out against this policy and you're utilizing it, that it, that it has to get paid back? And what happens if you invest it and that investment doesn't work out? 
Ah, that's a really good uh, good example because I just had one recently with that. I had a, a client of ours that he'd uh, started his banking policy and he was growing it for several years. It kept getting bigger and bigger, and he decided he told me he's like, Rob, I, help me, you know, take a loan. Can you can you walk me through that? I want to invest in this cryptocurrency. My friend told me that this is a moonshot and it's it's you know guaranteed. And I'm like, well, I'm not. Are you sure mm -hmm. you want to do that? And, you know, maybe pick one of the more stable coins that have been around longer and nobody's ever heard of this thing. And so he yeah. he borrowed the $10,000 out and he put it into this coin or like meme coin or, uh, you know, something or other. And boy, it went to zero in like two months. And the, the coin, I don't think is even listed on any exchange. You couldn't get it if you wanted to now. So that whole $10,000 was gone. But I tried to help him understand that, yes, but don't forget, that because you ran it through your policy first for the rest of your life, you'll still get benefit from that $10,000 and you'll still continue to see the cash grow, accumulate and compound on that $10,000 for the rest of your life, even though you borrowed it out and put it in an investment that has disappeared, as opposed to if you had taken the $10,000 out of Wall Street, out of Wells Fargo and uh, bought those meme coins and they yeah. disappeared. You would have no further utility or benefit from those dollars ever for the rest of your life. And he actually felt significantly better about that and started another policy uh, just in case he did any more risky, uh, you know, silly investments in the future. <laughs> so, well, so what happened to the money? The money's gone. You borrowed against it. Does that mean that whenever the life insurance policy pays out, it just pays out $10,000 less? That's exactly it. Yeah. So, you know, if it was a million dollar death benefit policy and because that could happen, even if it wasn't you buying a meme coin or a SHIT coin that went to zero, um, maybe you took out a loan, a very sensible loan for a, a very smart real estate investment, but you died, you know, two weeks after you took the loan out. So you never right. had any opportunity to replenish the loan. And so that was say that was a hundred thousand dollar loan and the total death benefit was a million dollars. And that loan hadn't been paid back. I'm assuming you would still own the real estate, so there'd still be some utility to that money. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, when you died, your heirs instead of getting the million, they would just subtract the hundred thousand loan from the million dollar death benefit, and your yeah. beneficiaries would receive nine hundred thousand. That's why life insurance companies really don't care about you taking loans or when you pay them back or uh, how soon you they pay them back. They know they're getting the money. money. They know they're getting right. the money. One hundred percent. They're collateralized. Who's making the loan? Is it the life insurance policy that's making a loan against the policy? Yeah, so you're taking a, a loan from the general fund of the insurance company, and we're paying interest on the loan at less than what we're earning inside the policy. So we're creating a hedge there as well. But yeah. that's not really the magic. That's just comparing you know, the first year, or sometimes people are comparing that to some other investment they could do somewhere. Well, I'd say do both. Put your money through your bank and then and make your investments so you earn in two places, you know, at the same time, because the magic's not really in the first year, it's that constant compounding where, you know, uh, yeah, I was only maybe earning five and a half percent the first year I had my first policy, but now my oldest policy, I just looked, I uh, got my statement a couple months ago, and it was a small little policy, a $10,000 a year uh, annual premium deposit, but the cash value had grown by $18,500. So that's 185% cash on cash return on the dollars that I'm putting into that policy. And it's guaranteed to only get better and go up from there. It'll never go down. It'll never have a bad year. And I just think that's absolutely fantastic because it's that constant compounding that, yeah, I may have earned, you know, 5% year one on my hundred dollars, but next, but year two, I'm earning that 5% on 105. And the year after that, I'm earning, you know, 5% on 110. And it doesn't take too many more years where, now that's just an incredible. So people are like, well, if I leave that loan out, I'm you know, paying you know four and a half or four point seven percent interest on that. Yeah, but do you think I care at this point, Brandon? And year fifteen, when I'm making one hundred and eighty five percent cash on cash return, what are the interest rate is three percent, four four and a half percent, five, ten, or even fifteen percent? No, because the spread is so incredible, it really just doesn't matter at this point. Yeah, this is powerful strategy. For those that want to learn more about this strategy, learn about, more about you, uh, maybe even set up a call to learn more about this specific vehicle, where can they go? Yeah, I would I would recommend it. This is this is uh, got the, uh, the 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 brain moving and the uh, the thought processes running. 
um, to go to our website at yourfinancialiq.org or yourfinancialiq.org. And we have a free masterclass training. So it's a full one hour of me going over everything about infinite banking from A to Z. We cover all the bases in about an hour. And that'll really give people a really uh, in-depth um, uh, understanding of this whole topic. And we show them how we'll even put their banking system and their debts or expenses or investment ideas into a spreadsheet. And we'll work with them to optimize it and make sure over the rest of their life that they're able to use their own banking system rather than just buying this product, this life insurance policy. The, the, the process is what's important. The product just happens to be this, you know, cash heavy, overfunded whole life insurance policy with a mutual and insurance company that pays dividends. That's just the product that we're using, but it's the process that's, that's really important. So I would encourage them to go in there. They can register to watch that uh, free webinar. And if uh, they really like what they see there, or that makes sense to them. Yes. At the end of that, it will offer them an opportunity to talk to us about that and schedule a strategy session to talk to them about their unique individual situation and how this might be a benefit to them and their family and their future and their legacy and their current financial situation and how they can implement that as well. We'll make sure that that link gets posted in the show notes. Dr. Rob, it has been fantastic having you on the show today. Thank you for coming on and enlightening us on this fantastic vehicle. You're welcome, Brandon. I really, I really enjoyed it. As you can see, I get a little uh, enthused and excited. Uh, it's not, not anger. It's just enthusiasm. If it seems it comes across that way. sometimes. <laughs> no, not at all, man. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. And if you're listening to this and you get value from this episode, Go ahead, take a quick second, leave us some reviews. It allows us to get other fantastic guests like Dr. Rob on the show and share it with your friends and family. Till next time, we'll see you guys.